My name is Allison, and I'm a lawyer. Kids, I don't know what your parents have told you about lawyers, but I'm here to tell you that lawyers are helpers who give people advice and make sure that the rules are followed that keep us safe and orderly. There are immigration lawyers who help people who want to move to the United States from another country. There are family lawyers who help a family to adopt a child. But I really want to talk to you about criminal lawyers who protect people's rights when they're accused of committing a crime. Being charged with a crime means being accused of breaking a rule. Anybody here ever been accused of breaking a rule? Oh, good company. So maybe by a parent or maybe by a teacher. And how does that feel? Lousy. A little scary, right? It can be pretty serious if you're an adult and you're accused of breaking a rule, breaking a law. What could happen if it's a serious crime? Hazel. You could get thrown in jail, right? I didn't even plant that. <laughs> Do you think that an adult should get a chance to tell her side of the story if she's accused of breaking a law? Maybe say, I wasn't even there. It wasn't me. Or you know what, I did break that rule, but I have a really important reason. Yeah. But that person might be scared to go into court and talk to the judge and the black robe and all of these people to tell their side of the story, right? So who can help? Those helpful, helpful lawyers, right? <laughs> do, you, do you think that it would be okay if the lawyer was sort of asleep at the table in court, taking a little nap, maybe drunk? Maybe they don't know the law. They haven't studied their law books very much. No. All the people in the criminal justice system need to do their job. All the pieces have to be working for this machine to work, right? Otherwise, it would be like taking a ride in an airplane with just one wing. Nobody wants a ride in that plane, right? So in particular, I want to talk to you about public defenders. They are the lawyers who have the hardest job of all. They represent people who are accused of crimes who don't have enough money to pay for a lawyer. And sometimes these people have really serious problems in their lives. Drug addiction or mental illness, for example. And I think that public defenders act like ministers, they stand beside these people with no judgment and listen to them, even though many other people in society may not want to listen to them. And public defenders make sure that they're treated fairly and that their lives matter. So my job is to train public defenders. I have this really cool superhero title Defender Educator. I'm the Defender Educator at the UNC School of Government. So I want to make sure that public defenders do a great job of protecting people's rights. Do you think it is fair if people are treated differently in the criminal justice system because they are black or Hispanic? No, that violates their rights under the Constitution like their right to equal protection of the law. But studies show that people are being treated differently. For example, black people are more likely to be stopped by a police officer than white people when they're driving their car, even though the white person has committed the same offense. Black people and white people use drugs at the same rate, but black people are more likely to be arrested and convicted of a drug crime. 
black people are more likely to go to jail or to prison for committing a crime than a white person who has committed the same offense. How can we make our criminal justice system more fair? Wouldn't it be great if all the people who worked in the courts, the lawyers and the judges, had a big old book that could help them figure out when race was playing an unlawful role in the case and how they could make the system work better when racial bias is entering in? We wrote the book, Raising Issues of Race in North Carolina Criminal Cases. It goes through all of the stages of a criminal case to help the lawyers and the judges protect people's right to a fair trial. We just finished this a few months ago. Now every public defender's office in the state has a copy of it. And last week, I gave a copy to all of the judges on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. This is the first legal reference of its kind in the nation. And the cool thing is I'm getting a lot of calls from lawyers in other states saying, how can we do what you're doing in North Carolina? Wouldn't it be great if we could have a team of lawyers from all around North Carolina come to Chapel Hill and get trained on all of these important topics in this book and take it home where they live to make their courts work more fairly? My coworkers and I thought so too. So we formed the first ever racial equity network. Applications have just gone out, 50 lawyers, will come to Chapel Hill and be trained over a two-year period on the topics in this book, and they will also be mentored, and we will give them help in their individual cases so they can take those lessons back home to their jurisdiction. As a member of the Indigent Defense Education Group at the School of Government, I write and teach about issues of criminal justice and racial justice to help lawyers do the important work of making sure people have a right to a fair trial. Thank you. Hi. I'm Emma Friedman. I'm 16 years old, and I'm a participant in the Sarah Inch Leadership Program at the Community Church. I learned about this program last December through Marion Hirsch, the Religious Education Director here at the church. I'd heard from previous interns that it was a great experience, and I was not disappointed. I applied for the Community Service Internship, and I started working with the Opportunities for Kids and Youth Project in the Community Service Ministry. This project helps raise money for uh, summer camps for students in our area that wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. I started going to the meetings and compiling information for the program, which doesn't sound as exciting as it was. It was actually a lot of fun and a new experience for me. I wasn't used to having to research information that I wasn't going to get a grade on. Throughout the summer, I continued to work with the organization by visiting camps, making sure they had what they needed, and publishing editorials in the local newspaper and radio stations. After I got into the swing of things, I started to understand how the organization worked, and I learned more and more about the programs that we supported. I also had the opportunity to work with other projects, such as the fundraiser for El Centro Hispano in September. As a student, I found that working with the community service ministry has changed the way I see my community. I gain skills and motivation to volunteer in other ways at my school and outside of it. Also, surrounding myself with awesome people from the church has made the time a lot more fun and fulfilling. I've learned two important things from the Sarah Inge internship. First is that there are a lot of problems out there that need fixing. Hunger, achievement gaps, homelessness. I knew that before, but I had become much more aware of it while learning about the organizations that work against it. 
But the more important thing that I learned is that there are enough compassionate people in the world to minimize those problems. I won't say that they can be ended, but they can be helped. I've met many hardworking people who are working to make the world a better place throughout this process and who have inspired me to do the same. This experience has been amazing for me because I have learned so much about my community, both within the church and outside of it. I've never been so involved in this church before, but the community service ministry has encouraged me to open myself up to new experiences. I'm so grateful to all of the people who have helped and supported me throughout this process, and I encourage people of any age to try something new in your community. Thank you. Good morning. So I am a social worker. Are there any other social workers here today? Raise your hand. Woohoo! Yes, we are a proud bunch as Unitarian Universalists. So I just want to say that we have a really cool profession, and I think all the kids could, should, should consider it, because we get to spend our days making the world a better place, which is pretty cool. So my dream is that one day all babies in North Carolina and in the U.S. will be born strong and well, to families who are ready to love and care for them, who live in communities that support them and provide them with a safe and healthy environment where they can all grow and flourish. My dream in the short version is that I want reproductive justice for everyone. Unfortunately, we have a long way to go to get to that dream. Well, the U.S. has a lot of resources, and we spend more money on health care than any country on the planet. We rank 28th in the world for the high rates of infants who do not survive to celebrate their first birthday. And while North Carolina has improved, we still rank 40th in the United States for our high um, rates of infant mortality. But what keeps me up at night is the fact that African American and American Indian babies have a two and a half times greater risk of not celebrating their first birthday than white babies. And even worse, that gap is getting bigger in North Carolina. It has grown over the past five years. So why does this happen and what can we do about it? Well, it is really complicated. First, well, it's hard to talk about. There's no question that racism is part of the problem. We know that African-American women with college degrees still have a higher risk of having their baby born sick than a white woman who didn't even graduate from high school. The impact of the stress of living with racism is starting to be understood on health, and babies tend to be our most sensitive indicator. Poverty is also a problem. There have been some really interesting studies done in cities across the country that suggest that a person's zip code is more predictive of their life expectancy than their genetic code. So people who live in more affluent neighborhoods may live 15 to 20 years longer than people who live in poor neighborhoods just a few miles down the road from them. We know that one of the legacies of racism is poverty, fewer job opportunities, inadequately funded schools, and less access to health care. And we also know that dads are really important, right, kids? Dads are really important. However, in a culture that puts a lot of black men in prison, there are fewer dads around in some communities, and their children and families miss out on all that they have to offer. So what are we doing about it? Well, in my job, I've been working hard to get people to think differently about how to improve birth outcomes. So first, with some really cool women um, we have from across nine southern states, we have formed a coalition called Every Woman Southeast, where we are able to talk about the reality of women's lives in the South and have conversations about equity, feminism, poverty, and what we can do about it. It's really fun. You should come. Um, in North Carolina, after about four years of work, um, my colleagues and I have worked with over 150 people from across the state to create one of the most innovative perinatal health strategic plans in the country, like the coolest plan in the whole United States of America. I tell you, I don't have my notebook, though. <laughs> um, 
This plan includes some really kind of small health-related goals, such as health care reform, culturally competent, quality health services for all, um, as well as strategies for better integrating services for families, community building, civic engagement, and addressing issues for working parents, poverty among young families, and racism. So if I look stressed out on Sunday, now you know why. <laughs> We um, introduced that plan to some stakeholders a couple weeks ago, which included some legislators, and I still have a job. So there's hope that we can actually move this forward. But what can Unitarian and Universalists do about all of this? Well, I think that we can do a lot. As a community, we tend to be a very privileged group. Um, and while this certainly doesn't mean that we haven't worked hard for the resources that we have, it does mean that we've had some advantages that other people haven't, and we need to recognize that fact. Our community gives us a safe place to talk about power and privilege, a place where we can better understand our own biases and find ways that we as individuals and a group can live differently. And when we can do that differently as a community, then we set a model for other communities and other groups to follow. We also have a chance to use our collective voices to work for change. So in my job, I am a state employee, dun, dun, dun. Um, which means that I have to walk a careful line with what I say on the job and in my email. However, I can put on my yellow shirt and come out with my faith community and stand on the side of love and yell and scream all I want to. And that is really, really important. Yes. <laughs> you also have a strong commitment to reproductive justice. Have any of you ever been on the UU Association's website and looked up the section on reproductive justice? Yes. It's really amazing. And I would love to see more of us in our church talking about what it means and how we can be more active in this arena. So personally, I believe that being part of this community is one thing that gives me the courage and energy that I need to keep working toward my dream, and I am thankful for all of you. Tom asked me to be the designated activist this morning, but in truth, I'm not an activist. I'm an agitator. <laughs> A newspaper called me that before I went into the ministry in Louisville, Kentucky, when I tried to go to see Porgy and Bess and discovered in 1959 that black people were not permitted to go to the theater in Louisville to see Porgy and Bess. All of the actors were people of color. And so I uh, started a protest at that theater, and then we uh, went on a freedom march to Indianapolis to see Porgy and Bess. And years later, after I had moved to Chapel Hill, you folks led me to Moral Monday. There were over 80 members of this church who went to Raleigh in Moral Monday last year and the year before. Would you stand, those of you who did go to Moral Monday, would you stand, please, so we see you and thank you. Those are our people. And 21 people got arrested there before I did. So I'm a follower, not a leader. But when I was a child, I grew up in a Unitarian Universalist white supremacist church. So when I told you about my wife in Starkville, Mississippi, I don't want to have you continue this dumb thing that sometimes Unitarian Universalists do in feeling superior to our Baptist cousins. When I was a child in Louisville, Kentucky, Black people were not permitted to come to the church. So my dad, who was the minister, assigned my mother to stand by the front door. And when a black person might come in, he, she would go with that person to sit in the congregation through the entire service so no one would approach her. 
And nobody messed with my mother. <laughs> That's where my, um, not so much activism, that was my ministry was activism, but my agitation was somewhere else. And it did get me to Moral Monday along with a whole lot of you, and it got me arrested with the others of the Tillis 14 when... <clears throat> Tom will show the picture, so those of you who can't see it from back there, I was arrested in Tom Tillis's office when I went to talk to him, and he chose not to be there with the other, with the 14 of us, and we spent the night in jail. Should we have gone to jail? Sure. We all went for one big reason, and that was to call attention to what was happening to our state. And sometimes, the only way, and I'm saying this especially to the kids, sometimes the only way you can speak to people is to stand up and do something that gets you in trouble. So be careful. Don't get in trouble when you are not really saying something important. But when you have to, it's okay. On Moral Monday, we went there to say, we don't like what's happening to our elderly. We don't like what's happening to our schools. Our teachers are being robbed. We don't like what's happening to our women who are not being able to make uh, choices about their reproduction, their reproductive health. We don't like what's happening to black citizens who are being gerrymandered. You know, the Democrats did it too. But we don't like those, those intrusions upon our system, and it's got to stop. We didn't go because we thought the politicians and legislators would listen to us. We knew they wouldn't. We went because we hoped everybody would listen to us. And the only way we could speak and be heard was to do that. And so when we went to Moral Monday to Raleigh, it was to speak to the people and from some of the people to all of the politicians and to say, this has got to stop. Did it end last year? No, no. And it's not going to stop after HK on J has its big launch next Saturday in Raleigh, and I hope you'll go. It's not going to stop next year. February 14th. I'm sorry, I got you a month ahead. <laughs> it's not going to stop next year either, or the year after. This is something we as Unitarian Universalists must pay attention to. We need to know our heritage, which was one of racism across the board in almost all Unitarian Universalist churches in the South before Selma. And when I went to Selma, I went to speak to the president of my church, 1965, and I told him, I'm going. And he said to me, if you go, you will not have a job when you come back. So I'm speaking to all of you. It is a continuing heritage that we make. We make that heritage, and we must and continue to do it until someday, someday, we will all be together in justice and peace and love. Thank you. Let's sing again. Um, this, uh, our next tune comes out of your teal hymnal. The hour is moving steadily along, so this will be a, a brief blessing and a succinct charge. On Friday night, I uh, invited anyone in the church to, to come together to see the, the movie Selma. And um, somewhere uh, almost nearly 100 members of our church came to see it. So we had a quarter a quarter of our members came together to see Selma together. It was an invitation and, 
And we showed up. We were, we were that theater. And in the movie, it was so good, so good to see that with friends, to see with you know, elders who had, who had lived through that period in our history along with, along with our you know, middle school youth who hadn't even yet learned about this in their American history class altogether. And there's this moment in the movie when King issues a call to Selma, calling on people and, and especially clergy of all faiths, of all races and all faiths, to join, come down to join the protests in Selma. And, and we see in the movie, we see a, a Greek Orthodox priest and a, a Jewish rabbi and a Catholic nun and, and lots of student activists come down and answer that call. And history tells us that UU ministers like Dick Weston here, answered the call in greater numbers than clergy of any other mostly white denomination. And the movie shows us uh, how Reverend James Reeb answered the call and, and layperson Viola Liuzzo answered that call. And this morning we've heard from members of our church who show up, who show up at their place of employment and, and do that work of helping our justice system become more just and to help our health care system work better so that children have better and healthier lives. We've heard about our youth who show up to come into the community and do work of making a difference. And we've heard about our agitators who show up when there is a need to speak truth and demand that, demand that they be heard. And so my charge to us today is in the days and weeks and months and years ahead for us to answer the call as well, to show up when there's an invitation to show up to show up when our voices are needed. There's, a, there's an old joke that I half like and half don't. It's actually a true story the, about a protest that went on for a long, long time. Uh, I think it was a, a war protest, and there was an Episcopalian priest who was there at the protest, on and on. And there, every single week, it was the, the Unitarian Universalists in their yellow shirts who showed up time and time again, could always be depended on. And the priest once said, God bless the Unitarians. They're not sure why they always show up, but they always show up. <laughs> and, I, and I half like the joke because half of it is true. The fact is that we do all, we are, we're the people who show up. And, uh, and I, the, the, other, the other half, the half that I don't like is because we know why we show up. We know where we show up. He doesn't. He doesn't think we know, but we do. But my charge to all of us today is to be the people who show up. That is my charge and our blessing to us today.